Thank you for this beautiful day that we have spent, that we have pre been preparing for your, uh, for the Sabbath. Dear Heavenly Father, please give us wisdom right now to understand your word, to understand your prophecy. Please open our eyes that we can see. Help us to learn and retain what we learn. I pray that you especially bless each one of us and those who are not with us right now, such as Susan, as she is taking care of her, of her mother. Please, dear, dear Father, bless us today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Can you guys, do you guys see the screen? Yeah. Okay. So, okay, how do you see this? This is very strange. This is not how I intend this to be. Stop share, share. Sister Lana, if you do that again, um, and it shows up like that, you go to the top of this. Oh, there you go. You got it. Okay. Yeah. Do you see it? Okay. So um, this presentation is in God we trust, and uh, we will study the history of how in God we trust and uh, one nation under God has uh, the phrase. The, the phrases have become uh, very ingrained in our. Uh, in our society, and um, is taken as a as a given. So we will st first start with um, twenty five twenty. That the just a short overview. That twenty five twenty is uh, uh, two times twelve sixty, and uh, twelve sixty uh, comes from uh, the prophecy of. Uh, so when we combined the line of Millerites with our line, we came to conclusion that 2014 is midway. So to to um, as a short overview to understand where does 1260 comes from, it comes from many 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 take care of our sin. So uh, the first. As a short overview, uh, we want to go to the history of civil war. It starts with uh, 1861 uh, by, in early 1860s, uh, in 1861, there was a call by religious organizations and Protestant churches for religious inscription on currency due to national crisis. So, since night since 1798 they had 63 years to sort out the problem with uh slavery uh but uh, in 1861 uh they realized that the nation is under judgment and uh the protestant churches are calling for uh, uh to have some kind of religious inscription put on currency and uh so by 1863, the phrase is decided, but if you look between 1861 and 1863, the Democrats are winning. And the, at that time, the Democrats were the, South, were the South and Republicans were the North. So the Republicans were for the Union and Democrats for, um, for the Confederacy. And uh, in, this, in the first Part before the midway, before 1863, the Democrats are winning and the Republicans are in panic. And uh, they have, uh, in the North, they have come up with the phrase, in God we trust. So in 18, February 1863, there was uh, begun an organized movement by a religious combination composed of the evangelical churches of the country to get the government of the United States committed by uh, by direct legislation to a recognition of the Christian religion and a national adoption and enforcement of Sunday as the Christian Sabbath, the Lord's Day. They proposed first to accomplish their purpose by the amendment to the national constitution, declaring this to be a Christian nation. 
and so placing all Christian laws, institutions, and usages upon an undeniable legal basis in the fundamental law of the land. So this is from the National Reform Movement. And uh, early, so early in 1863, the Civil War had not been going well for the North. Distressed over the terrible disaster, his troops had suffered, suffered at Fredericksburg in December. General Ambrose Burnside had just stepped down as commander of the Army of the Potomac, interpret, interpreting the Union, the, the Union def, defeats, uh, interpreting the Union, the Union's defeat as a manifestation of divine wrath. Clergymen representing eleven Protestant denominations met at Xenia, Ohio, on February the February fourth, eighteen sixty three seeking ways to appease an angry God. This meeting led to, to the formation of the National Reform Association. So they see the defeat of the Republican side as a manifestation of God's wrath. They seek ways to appease God's anger and meet in Ohio and form National Reform Association. So why was God angry with U.S. according to the National Reform Association? It was because of the failure of the government, as they thought, it was the failure of the government to acknowledge the Lordship of Jesus Christ and to enforce his moral law. So even after the war was over and the Northwood had won, they retained this conviction that Jehovah was displeased with America. The National Reform Association continued to warn for at least the next three decades that the divine judgment threatens the U.S. all through 1890s. So also 1890s, the, our pioneers were fighting this ideology. They were fighting the National Reform Movement. And actually, A.T. Jones extensively wrote in his, um, in, um, um, especially in the American Sentinel, the American Sentinel, there is uh, many articles were dedicated to this, uh, to this, to this movement. So this, uh, the main idea of this presentation was that, that, that there's two streams of information and uh, those two streams of information, they uh, deliver different explanations to the, to the current events, to, do, to the events that uh, pertain to the present events. And both see the civil war as the judgment of God, but different conclusions. So on, on the side of the Hidekel, so there's two rivers, the Hidekel and Ulai. Uh, on the side of Hidekel, uh, the information, uh, the stream of Hidekel is that they perceive the defeat of the Union as a manifestation of God's anger. So they, so they wanted to appease an angry God. While Ellen White, she has a different explanation. It's very down to earth and it's, it's really straightforward is that the U.S. is judged for slavery and God is particularly angry with, uh, with the religious bodies who sanction slavery, which is the Protestant churches. They, the, it's so, so that um, God was angry with Protestant, even, uh, Protestant churches that were tolerating uh, what was going on in the South. So they don't realize that they are the reason this nation is being judged, and they think it's all the immoral people, atheists, etc. So if you go in the back in the history, in um, you can see the two two streams uh, and two different explanations. And this is something that is not part of uh, like I have I have never something that I learned specifically being as being. As becoming part of this movement, that uh, uh, this expl these explanations are very distinct; they are separate, and that that we that by going back into history, we can learn the present, and uh, and truly, not everything that happened uh, uh, is like a prophecy, is like a parable for the for the people at the time of the end. So. Um, so in 1863, it's a, uh, so if you look, if you take 151, 
uh, from 2014, you'll end up in 1863. And in 1863, since 2014 is the midway, uh, then 1863 is the midway. And uh, at 1863 is the Battle of Gettysburg, uh, the tide turns, the Republicans start winning and Lincoln introduces one nation under God in the Pledge of Allegiance, he introduces the phrase one nation under God. So in a, so 1861 on our reform line is 9-11 or April 19. 1863 is a midway mid midpoint between the between the tearing of the bridegroom and the shut door so what is okay so 1865 on our line is 2019 and uh so the midway is a turning point So, so what is so if we consider 151 and subtract 151 from 2019, we get 1868. And what is the issue in 1868? It's the 14th and 15th amendments that give rights to freed slaves. So this uh, these amendments they introduce male pronouns, and by doing so, they make sure that women do not get the right to vote. So this is the beginning of the women's suffrage movement. And for the, so for the first time, the Constitution asserted that men, not women, had the right to vote. Previously, only the state laws restricted, restricted the voting rights to men. Also, it's as a side note, 1868, 1868 is also, um, 1868 is also a, uh, uh, first case of, of impeachment of a U.S. president. So when Lincoln died, and those uh, uh, the new president um, was on the on the side was favoring the South, and he he sought to restrict the freedom of the slaves. So if we go back 63 years from 2019, uh, where so why 63 years? Let's just go back again to remind ourselves that 63 is the half of 1226. So if we uh, subtract, if we go back 63 years from 2019, it brings us to 1951, and 1951 is a midpoint. So here on the right, you can see that it's the it's actually from the book, but it's a, was a, um, the article was uh, adopted for the New York Times. Uh, it's called, it was written by Kevin Cruz and it, it was called One Nation, a Christian Nation Since When? So he also wrote a book called One Nation Under God. So America may be a nation of believers, but when it comes to this country's identity as a Christian nation, our beliefs are all over the map. Back in the 1930s, business leaders found themselves on the defensive. Their public prestige has, had plummeted with the Great Crash. Their private businesses were under attack by Frank, Franklin D. Roosevelt's new, new Deal, from above and labor from below. To regain the upper hand, corporate leaders fought back on all fronts. They waged a figurative war in state houses and occasionally a literal one in the streets. Their campaigns extended from courts of law to the courts of public opinion, but nothing worked particularly well until they began an inspired public relations offensive that cast capitalism as the handmaiden of Christianity. So they made a very smart move. Accordingly, throughout the 1930s and 1940s, corporate leaders marketed a new ideology that combined elements of Christianity with anti-federal libertarianism. Powerful business lobbies like the United States Chamber of Commerce and the National Association of Manufacturers led the way, promoting this ideology's appeal in conferences and PR campaigns. General funding came from, the, from prominent business, businessmen 
from household names like Harvey Firestone, Conrad Hilton, Hutton, Fred Maytag, uh, Luz, and uh, lesser known the US leaders, US Steel, General Motors, and Japan. In a shrewd decision, these executives made clergymen their spokesmen. As Sun's, Sun Oil's Howard Pugh noted, polls proved that ministers could mold public opinion more than any other profession. And so these businessmen worked to recruit clergy through private meetings and public appeals. Many answered the call, but the three, they, but the three deserve special attention. So one of them is the Reverend James Firefield, known as the 13th Apostle of Big Businesses and St. Paul of the Prosperous. Emerged as an early evangelist for the cause, preaching to pews of millionaires at the elite First Congregational Church in Los Angeles, Firefield said, reading the Bible was like eating fish. We take the bones out to enjoy the meat. All parts are not of equal value. So you pick and choose. So he dismissed the New Testament warnings about the corruption corrupting nature of wealth. Instead, he paired Christianity and capitalism against the, against the New Deal's pagan statism. Through his national organization, Feifeld promoted freedom under God and um, eventually, um, eventually it encouraged, okay, uh, uh, Mass, they mass recruited monthly uh, mass circul uh, uh, they were spreading uh, buying all the advertisements uh, where they would uh, um, encourage ministers to preach sermons uh, on the on um, teams in com in, comp in competition for cash prizes. So liberals howled at the group's conflation of God and greed. In 1948, the radical journalist Kerry McWilliams denounced it in a withering expose. But Mr. Firefield exploited, exploited such criticism to raise more funds and redouble his efforts. So another one is uh, Abraham V. Ride. He advanced Christian libertarianism, libertarian cause with a national network of prayer groups. So that's how uh, prayer groups slowly have been, prayer, uh, national prayer breakfast has slowly been introduced into the uh, politics. Uh, began, he began building prayer breakfast groups in cities across America to bring business and political elites together in common cause. The big man and real leaders in New York and Chicago, he wrote his wife, look up look up to me in an embarrassing way. In Manhattan alone, James Cash Penny, um, all the so big business leaders, they were they all were sought in audience audiences with him. So in 1942, Mr. Viride's influence spread to Washington. He persuaded the House and Senate to start weekly prayer meetings in order that we might be a God-directed and God-controlled nation. Mr. Viride opened headquarters in Washington, God's embassy, he called it, and, be and became a powerful force in his previously secular institutions. Among other activities, he held dedication ceremonies for several justices of the Supreme Court. No country or civilization can last unless it's founded on Christian values, um, announced Justice Tom Clark. So the most, another one important person in advance, uh, important clergyman for Christian libertarianism was Reverend, uh, was Billy Graham. In his initial ministry in early 50s, Mr. Graham supported corporate interests so zealously that a London paper called him the big business evangelist. The Garden of Eden, he informed, reveal, revival, he informed revival at, at attendees with a paradise with no union, no union dues, no labor leaders, no snakes, no disease. In the same spirit, he denounced all government restrictions in economic affairs. 
which he invariably attacked as socialism. So this is the beginning of the dangerous slope. In 1952, Mr. Graham went to Washington and made Congress his congregation. He recruited representatives to serve as ushers at packed revival meetings and staged the first formal religious service held on Capitol steps. That year, at his urging, Congress established an annual National Day of Prayer. And he said, if I would run for president of the United States today on a platform of calling people back to God, back to Christ, back to Bible, I'd be elected. Coming out of the Great Depression and Roosevelt's New Deal, the business leaders were losing power. So they connect their version of capitalism with Christianity. And now, now when they have, uh, when they figured out how to get to, uh, how to get to people, how to actually get what they want, uh, they, it was very successful on their part. It was a very smart move. So this leads up to 1950s. And in 1950s, we have a national crisis. And, uh, after the Great Depression and World War II, people become terrified of socialism, especially that they were very terrified of the, of the um, Cold War and Russia and you know, Soviet communism. So the fear of socialism timeline summary. So in this, if we compare this, uh, these three histories, um, the history of civil war is the history of um, the um, the midway in the mid fifties and the history of um, uh, um, post nineteen eighty nine uh, we see the similar the similar pattern and we see that it's that um, that um, this two streams are separate and they never cross. So in the history of civil war, people are terrified. This uh, terrified of all those godless, wicked, slave-holding southerners and immoral people. The victory of the civil war reinforced their idea that God was on their side. And uh, in the history of the in the of the beginning of the Cold War, the Protestant churches are blaming again on 80s communist socialists and see the need to enforce the moral law. They are holding on to the same ideology that they had in Civil War period. So in the history of 9-11, the Protestant churches again blame on immorality, atheist, and again see need to enforce the moral law. So, so they have their ide ideology just does not change. It's all the same. They, they always blame they always they see, they recognize that the nation is under judgment, but then they blame immorality, atheists, anybody else, but not themselves. So they, they lack self-introspection um, or um, self-awareness. I'm not quite um, sure which one of them probably introspection. So the fear of socialism. OK, let's, let's uh, see um, what happened in the mid 50s. The time when actually to which uh, President Donald Trump wishes us to bring back to. In 1948, Louis Bowman, an attorney from Illinois, suggests to the National Society of the Daughters of the American Revolution that they introduce the phrase under, okay, under God into their Pledge of Allegiance. So in the here, um, In God, in the Civil War, um, in God, the, um, the phrase "In God We Trust" is being, has been introduced and reinforced in the end. And even even so, the uh, the Republicans won. Uh, they did not change their way of thinking. They they were still convinced that the the, the victory was just for them uh, was a, was a, like an affirmation that they were right. That that uh, that what they needed to do is to put in the phrase "In God We Trust" and they appease the angry God. So when we when we go back to the um, history of the 1950s, uh, 
again, there is another push for another phrase, and uh, the phrase uh, "one nation under God." And the uh, Louis Bowman attorney from Illinois suggests that uh, they introduce this phrase into the, their pledge of allegiance, and then soon after uh, this. Uh, the Society of Sons and Daughters of the American Revolution has adopted this phrase. And, uh, and in um, 1951, the Catholic organization Knights of Columbus incorporated the phrase into their Pledge of Allegiance. So in 1954, if finally, George Doherty delivers sermon, New Birth of Freedom, claiming that the U.S. Pledge of Allegiance is missing under God. And uh, President Eisenhower was uh, was in the audience, and he, uh, being a uh, pi uh, God-fearing Christian, he uh, took it as an instruction. So adoption of under God is similar to the gradual, gradual acceptance of in God we trust in the history of civil war. In the very next day on February, February of 1954, a bill was introduced into Congress. The Congress passed the necessary resolution and Eisenhower signed the bill into law. From this day forward, the millions of our school children will daily proclaim in every city and town, every village and rural schoolhouse, the dedication of our nation and our pledge and our people to the Almighty. To, en to anyone who truly loves America, nothing could be more inspiring than to contemplate this rededication of, of our use um, to our country's true meaning. In this way, we are reaffirming the transcendence of religious faith in America's heritage. In this way, we shall constantly strain, strengthen those spiritual weapons, weapons which forever will be our country's most powerful resource in peace or in war. So, in the history of the Civil War, there is a call, like a summary, the history of Civil War, there is a call to uh, come up with a phrase. They come up with a phrase um, in 1963, uh, and then they finally, uh, as an act of Congress, they adopt the phrase, uh, in God we trust, and uh, on the, in the history of uh, 1950s, uh, there is a, another call to adopt the phrase under God. And then finally, um, uh, the bill was signed and passed in 1954. Um, and in, in, 2000, in the history of 9-11, uh, we see similar, similar to similar streams of information and to similar to two different explanations of why 9-11 happened. So in this um, article, Vision, from vision.org, in the early 50s, after the Soviet Union had successfully tested an atomic weapon, the Cold War escalated. The many perceived the heightened fear of potential nuclear holocaust as a battle between godless communism and God-fearing America. Once again, religious sentiment played a significant role as the United States House of Representatives introduced a resolution to adopt the phrase as America's national motto. So in, it, it was that in, in that environment with this Cold War that Congress decided that in God we trust, which trust should be the new motto, reclaiming this notion that we are a chosen people and that we were conceived under God and that we flourish under God. And we turn our backs on God at our own peril. So in 1956, President Eisenhower signed into law that congressional resolution. And on November 1st, 2011, the House of Representatives uh, reaffirmed the national vote motto and, and encouraged its display in all public schools and government buildings. So this insertion of the phrase was a pushback against the Russian atheistic communism during the Cold War, given by fear and annihilation from atheistic Russia. The phrase in God we trust was made into official motto of the US. So in but before the in God we trust before this motto, the original one was a pluribus unum, out of many one, and it's a beautiful motto. 
many states in one nation, uh, many cultures, many religions. Uh, it's a perfect motto, but they rejected it. Nine eleven era, 9-11 Islam strikes. And how does Protestant America respond? In post 9-11 America, evangelical preachers gleefully whipped up the flames of Islamophobia and blamed the attack on America's decadent acceptance of feminism and homosexuality. So after the financial crisis of 2008, there was a renewed call to, pros uh, to the prosperity gospel, which held that God would deliver personal riches to those who showed their faith through tithing and confession. So, and when given, um, this doctrine was preached beneath the same roofs whose holy text taught that Jesus once scattered the merchants and money changes from the temple in anger. And uh, when, um, when it nominated uh, Donald Trump, um, evangelicals chose to vote for Trump and hew themselves to perhaps the most immoral presidency since Woodrow Wilson's segregationist government. And here you see Anna Graham Lotz, daughter of Billy Graham, and uh, she comes in this history as an, um, she explains that, that she speaks for the evangelical Protestants. And she says that our nation seems to be shaking its fist in God's face and telling him to get out of our politics, get out of our schools, get out of our businesses, get out of our marketplace, get off the streets. It's just stunning to me the way we are basically, aban basically abandoning God as a culture and as a nation. We're struggling with our own pride or self-sufficiency I think that is why God allows bad things to happen. I think that's why we would allow 9-11 to happen. He would allow 9-11 to happen or the dreadful attack in San Bernardino or some of those, some of these other places to show us that we need him. We're desperate without him. So again, they have the same, the same reasoning, nothing changed. Lots then claimed that God would protect Americans from everything, including terrorists, hurricanes, if they repent and pray. Um, she, if she says that uh, God would be, God would reveal the plots of our enemies and terrorists before they are carried out. If the weather, uh, even the weather patterns, He can even control the weather patterns and protect us from the violent storms that would that are taking human life. So if 9-11 didn't turn us to prayer like that, if San, Bernard if San Bernardino doesn't, it almost frightens me to think what would it take to make us so desperate that we will cry out to God and we'll get on our face and repent, she said. So then um, they, they see 9-11 as punishment for immorality, gays, transgenders, and for exclusion of God from politics. And her brother, Franklin Graham, founder of the charity Samaritan Spurs, accused uh, Barack Obama of spreading uh, immorality while praising Vladimir Putin of instituting a ban on gay propaganda. This is the problem with the religious right. Their hero is Vladimir, Vladimir Putin. They think that he is so moral. If you have read the writing of A.T. Jones, what right does the U.S. politics have to include God? Has no right. But this is who the Protestants are blaming for 9-11. Here you see, um, I think it's Franklin Graham, who is uh, President Trump. So in each of these stories, if you compare and side by um, line them up or one under another, in each of you see that in each of these stories, Protestant churches of the U.S. always blame the God, blame the God's judgment on secularization of the society, immorality, gays, lesbians, um, and uh, exclusion of God from political arena. In each of these stories, there are two streams of information that are influencing the people. And in each of these stories, Protestant America's solution is in enforcing morality. In the history of 9-11, they have exact same stream of information. So um, this kind of ideology hasn't stopped and it continued through the cyclone that hit New Orleans. 
in New Orleans, they blamed God's judgment on gay pride, gay pride march, and some in this movement thought, thought the same thing. Interesting that when the cyclone hits Florida, they go quiet. Suddenly, it doesn't work anymore. In the, after, in the aftermath of the Hurricane Harvey, evangelical leaders blamed the LGBT uh, community. But did a, how did, let's see how did Obama tra tra uh, trade the phrase. And he, he when, well, in 2010, he says, he says he picks a pluribus unum, thus asserting the separation of church and state. So in 2001, prior to 9-11, the new law issued in Mississippi requiring to place the inscription in God we trust in public places, on buses, on walls, everywhere. And after 9-11, the 9-11 has reinforced this, um, gave this law a powerful leverage and reinforced their, uh, their agenda. So if we study our history of um, uh, past 1989, we see that prior to 1914, it's the, dem uh, the Democrats are winning. But uh, in 2014, the tide turns. So before 2014, the ship is on course. It's on course under Obama, and then she goes off course. Um, so he, and um, when he declares, when Obama stated the uh, national, national motto, a pluribus unum, he gets attacked by the churches for this. They see it as a threat and a threat to their, um, to their agenda. And when reciting the Pledge of Allegiance, um, he did not include, he would not include under God. And again, supporting, uh, asserting the separation of church and state. And uh, evangelicals are, uh, they were furious. Some of the important events that happened in 2014 as well were that Steve Bannon meets Cardinal Burke at Vatican and uh, Cambridge Analytica happens. Republican donors start to fund, this work, uh, fund his work, Steve Bannon's work. And uh, Steve Bannon at the conference in Vatican, he says, we are at the very beginning stages of a very brutal and bloody conflict of which if the people in this room the people in the church do not bind together and really form what I feel is an aspect of the church militant to really be able to not just stand with our beliefs, but to fight for our beliefs against this new barbarity that's starting. So if you notice, he speaks, the, he speaks our language, the church militant. He says, we are too secular. We need to get back to our Christian roots. And in his speech, uh, he articulated a view of the world as a constant conflict between capitalist Jewish Christian West and godless socialism, communism, Islam, etc. So conservatism is like to conserve, to protect the Judeo-Christian culture and values. It it has um, it's a it's it's a may it's a leading theme in all of this history. Another important movement that started in 2014 is uh, Make America Great Again. But if, if uh, when we study further, we will see that it actually originates uh, in the 70s. The Make America Great Again equivalent to, um, as may, you may have noticed, that it's a national reform movement. So national, nationalism, reform, Make America Great Again. So this MAGA movement is the same movement from the history of the Civil War. They have the same agenda. Both see U.S. as being under judgment. Both want to reform it, to turn it around into something that they think it was before. But they definitely are not right about, uh, about, um, about the purpose of the United States. So Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation leader um, says that church and state separation is the death knell for our nation. 
uh, Lee Carowan, uh, Congressional Prayer Caucus Foundation, uh, director of the uh, foundation, warned that separation of church and state is a part of a liberal plan to ruin America and will be the death knell of our, fund, of our nation. She, um, that she says that many churches have, American people and many churches have bought into a very insidious lie, which is the misapplication, misinformation regarding that phrase, the separation of church and state. Um, that if the church of God, if the Christians do not engage in the public square and do not see that as their responsibility, their right and, respons their right and responsibility, then those that do not believe like us will absolutely fill the void. And what people don't understand is that every nation will reflect somebody's values. And up until now, it's reflected Judeo-Christian values because Christians have held to it and they have protected it every single generation. But if we do not protect, the, protect, protect it in our generation, if we buy this lie and we back out of the public square like we have for a decade or several decades now, we will find that we no longer have a free republic. The threat is very real. So what does A.T. Jones have to say about this? He says that uh, when the papacy was formed and the power of the empire was seized upon by the professed Christ Christian church, just as these people are now trying to do to protect the day and the things generally considered holy, there was again introduced the spirit of persecution and principles which produced the dark ages and the fearful despotism that ruled in those ages. So he basically says that it's this desire to protect something considered holy uh, uh, led uh, to emergence of papacy. And later on, he said, further down, he actually says that our fathers who framed this new nation seeing the long course of oppression marked by a steady st stream of blood in the attempts of government to protect things and institutions generally considered holy decided that this government should be cursed with any such thing and therefore declared that no religious test shall ever be required as qualification to any office of public trust under this government and that congress shall make no law respecting an an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. And so they rightly decided to leave the holy things to themselves and to protect themselves. So he further says very, very clearly that no government can really protect anything that is really holy. If it indeed be, if it be indeed holy, whatever connection the government has with it, it will just as certainly make it unholy to the extent that this connection is recognized by anybody. So he says that if something is holy, it doesn't need to be protected. It's fully able to support its own character of holiness and to secure respect for itself as such. If it's not really holy, then it ought not to be protected at all. For the sooner the falsehood is exposed and unholy thing destroyed, the better for all concerned. So right is not decided by majorities, even so the majority, even so the majority might be right. Yet how fast this wicked uh, principle of majority rule in matters of religion and conscience is growing. But this question is not a question of majorities or minorities, for if the conscience of the majority is to be standard, then there is no such thing as right of conscience at all. It is against the predominance and power of majorities that, we, that the rights of our conscience are protected and, ha and have need to be. And those who call themselves Protestants are not the only people in the world who have a conscience. This is a really powerful statement, which is interesting that if you notice, I don't know if you guys uh, heard about, um, about this, idea, uh, this idea that uh, only, only Christians know uh, only Christianity will show you what's right and wrong, meaning that you will not, like you can't know right from wrong unless you're a Christian. At least that's the idea that, um, like in my church, I've been, you know, quite uh, strongly um, uh, popularized that uh, 
you have a higher chance of being saved if you're if you're a Christian. But uh, but here he says he says that not and you know guys it's actually if you go in in uh, John uh, Gospel of John uh, first the very first uh, chapter where he says that in the beginning was there was light and the light was with God the, in the beginning was word. And the word was with God, and the word was God. And then, if you go down to uh, for, uh, verse nine, um, if I can, one moment, I'll just pull it up. John, verse nine. John. Okay. So in the beginning was in the beginning was was the word the word was with God and the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by it and without it was made nothing that was made. In it was life and that life was the light of man. And that light shines in the wilderness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Um, this true light, uh, verse 9, this true light which lights every man that comes into this world. He was, uh, he was uh, basically, it, to me, it was a crucial uh, text that shows actually that uh, Salvation is available for every human being born in this world. So even even if we, um, the idea is that you can be the light shines to everybody, and the, and everybody under the sun, everybody is, who is born has this um, a share of Holy Spirit and a share of conscience, whether they follow it or not. It's different different question. But uh, but it's a it's a it was like it's like a a proof that not just simply those who listen and hear are um, able to distinguish right from wrong. So, but anyway, um, I think we should move on. Establishment of the moral majority. So, in this history, we um, if we go back the history prior to. Um, the history between the 50s and uh, 9-11 in 1979 is the establishment of the moral majority uh consider the uh, origins of the moral majority in the 70s falwell brought together a group of fundamentalist pastors who had independent churches to discuss what should be what should be done then in the late 70s and early 80s he preached that christians by which he meant evangelical Christians should engage in the world and save America from moral decline and secular, secular, secularism. He essentially said, look, we've made this false distinction between the sacred and secular. In fact, everything is sacred. For too long, we've left business to Wall Street and politics to the people in Washington. We need to train men of God to become lawyers and businessmen and members of Congress. We have to mobilize our people to turn this country around. In this, it was this message that permitted from fundamentalists and many conservative evangelicals um, to aspire to worldly success, to involve themselves in politics. So the moral majority is um, with their efforts, with their uh, propaganda, uh, they got the first victories that uh, they got Ronald Reagan into office. And um, Protestants um, uh, and the Christians uh, of America are very happy about it. Uh, but if you look closer, the very idea of um, uh, how, how how Christianity, how Protestant Christianity, have been deeply entrenched in this uh, in um, in this idea that. Uh, that to be a good Christian, you have to be a 
capitalist or you have to be, or otherwise you are a communist or a socialist. So in 1974, the IRS revoked the tax exempt status from Bob Jones University uh, because they uh, they practiced, they forbade international marriages and uh, they refused to uh, admit uh, engaged applicants engaged in international marriage or dating. And prior to 1971, black people were not allowed to attend. And the university filed a countersuit that the IRS violated the first amendment rights of the institution and the supreme court eventually resolved it in in the favor of irs christians perceived that the right to segregate was their first amendment right and here you can trace the same um the same ideology that uh, the south had in the history of the civil war when they thought that it was the south saw that it was their religious freedom it, it was infringement upon their religion Upon their First Amendment right to own this, to own slaves. So this decision, um, the Supreme Court siding with the uh, um, um, with the IRS uh, infuriated Falwell and uh, and many other Protestant evangelicals, uh, and and he wanted to keep the tax exempt status and still allow segregation. So what brought Fowell and other white evangelicals into a common cause in the late 70s was this interference by, by the IRS. They brought, they brought about a ruling that stripped tax exempt status uh, from all white private, school, private schools formed in the South. And in reaction to Brown versus Board of Education, Supreme Court ruling to, to desegregate public schools, Bob Falwell had founded one of the schools in Lynchburg, though he and other white evangelicals insisted that their schools were Christian economy academies, not segregation academies. So through the rise, so here you see the you see that the model, uh, the history of our, the preceding preceding to 9/11, that the moral majority had pushed um, and aided in election of Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, George Bush, and uh, this. Uh, in this um, controversy, the religious right found its vo um, so in in this uh, the controversy between I uh, the fight with IRS, uh, the religious right found its voice and power, and it was a common cause that brought different universities and, and evangelicals together. And in the decades following World War II, evangelicals, especially white evangelicals in the North, had drifted towards the Republican Party. And, cli and climbed in that direction by fears, uh, where they, they were driven by fear of Cold War, suspicions of Catholicism, and work of Billy Graham and his friendship with Eisenhower and Nixon. So, so Billy Graham had, and uh, Billy Graham had had uh, and three two others played a big role in uh, um, in advancing the interests of the Christian right. And moral majority. Though this, so the rise of segregation academies was often timed exactly with the, with the segregation of formerly all white public schools. Um, their cause was freedom, no, not inequality, not the freedom to associate with whites, as the previous generation of massive resistors had claimed, but the freedom to practice their own embattled religion. It was a shrewd. It was a shrewd transposition. In one fell swoop, the heirs of slaveholders became the descendants of the pers persecuted Baptists, and Jim Crow, a heresy of the first the heresy the First Amendment was meant to protect. So, so they have they have uh, um, this. They have achieved their uh, their goal by 1989. So let's 
let's look at the national reform. So let's uh, look at the contro uh, controversy um, that the, in, in this controversy, the religious right uh, found its voice and power. It was the common cause that brought this, uh, this different universities together. And this, uh, I guess this is what I wanted to read. The moral majority was founded a few years later, formally establishing Christian rights' most powerful political co coalition of the time. Paul Weyrich, Weyrich, the late conservative Christian po political activist and co-founder of Heritage Foundation, um, he says that the new political philosophy must be defined by us conservatives in moral terms packaged in non-religious language and propagated throughout the country by our new coalition. So it's a birth, this will give birth to a Christian coalition then later on. When political power is achieved, the moral majority will have the opportunity to recreate the, this great nation. Wyrick could be thought of as the original Make America Great Again evangelist, a man who was committed committed to an idealized notion of what America was once was and dedicated his entire life to reinstating the dominance of a white middle-class Christian patriarchy. The contemporaries of the now defunct moral majority continue to weaponize religious freedom to advance the rights over, overarching goals of maintaining and advancing cultural, economic, and political dominance and at the expense of those who have been historically marginalized, including women, LGBTQ people, poor people, and non-Christians. So if you um, can see that the National Reform Association of the 60s is the, has the same ideology of the moral majority and Christian right of the 70s, and the, and the Christian coalition that will lead up to uh, to make America great again movement. So here, take a, uh, take a sermon of uh, Falwell delivered to his church in 1980 on the importance of the moral majority. He says, we're fighting a holy war. What's happened to America? to America is that the wicked are bearing rule. We have to lead the nation back to the moral stance that made America great. In other words, Falwell wanted to make America great again. So does his son. And he chose the candidate who shares his dream. We need to wield influence on those who govern us. We need to wield political power. And we need to make, to make America great again. It's Jerry, Jerry, it's Jerry Falwell, 1980s. Uh, here you see Jerry Fowler as President Ronald Reagan. So in 1989, Jerry Fowler, the, mov the movement of moral majority comes to an end. And uh, it's very successful and he's very satisfied. And he says, our mission is accomplished. So um, while while this this movement has um, pre, uh, resulted in the election of uh, Ronald Reagan and uh, uh, by us propaganda that uh, Jimmy Carter is not a Christian but a traitor to the country. And uh, in 1989, he says, our mission is accomplished. I feel that I've performed the task to which I was called in 1979. Why? because it's the time of the end and there is no going back. We have Ronald Reagan and George Bush. So, so um, their task is accomplished. And uh, after the, uh, you can see that, I guess I just put in the tweet so that you can, you can uh, see that he's truly, uh, Jerry Fowler Jr. Uh, Jr. is, uh, that is, uh, uh, it's quite recent, 2019. No obstruction, no collusion. New York Times admits Barack Obama did spy on his campaign and the economy is soaring. I now support reparations. Trump should have two years added to his first term as payback 
for time stolen by this corrupt failed coup. So as you can see that President Trump is very happy about it and uh, the, he has a full support of our evangelical uh, Protestants. So in 2016, in the early morning hours of November 9, 2016, Gold, uh, um, God told Frank and media, it's, so there's this movement that's called uh, uh, Photos Shield. Uh, this, is, this is Trump's Dominionist Prayer Warriors and the Prophetic Order of the United States. So they get together and they pray about Trump uh, and uh, they, they are devoted, devoted to helping Trump to bring about the reign of God in America and the world. Um, they are, okay, um, a media described the divine origins of Potter's shield during a gathering that spread over three days in March of 2017 at the Northeastern Ohio Church, Ohio Church he pastors. Interspersed with Pentecostal worship, liturgical dancing, speaking in tongues, shofar blowing, and Israeli flag waving, a media and other Potter's shield leaders put forth their vision for a Christian America and their plans to bring it to fruition. So prayer, political engagement, and organizing in all 50 states. Among the many decrees made at the event was that Islam must be completely broken down. It's interesting that, uh, that, um, that they really, it's such a direct fulfillment of prophecy where, where the Islam must be broken down before, before the total um, control, uh, before the, uh, the beast takes full control. The movement's ideology is grounded in a verse from the biblical book of Ephesians, which is also interesting, in which the Apostle Paul describes five kinds of leadership calling, callings that Christ granted to people in Christianity's founding era in order to build up the church. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. So this, um, this uh, movement, they believe that centuries for centuries the church had abandoned the first two meaning that abandoned apostles didn't have apostles and prophets but they believe that god has moved in our time to establish the ancient roles for apostles and prophets who will transform christianity and bring about the kingdom of god on earth so this uh, uh, movement uh, is also they, so the, the, it is meant to be disruptive to the rest of the Christian church. It views denominationalism as a sin and views established denominations and leaders as resistant to the reestablishment of the offices of prophet and apostle. Wagner, who died last year, so he was the head of the, uh, this movement, believed that today's apostles and prophets would bring about the most radical changes to Christianity since the Reformation in the 16th century. Changes that were meant to allow the church to fulfill its true mission, a triumphant dominion taking church. Wagner's disciples believe will establish the kingdom of God on earth and set the stage for the second coming of Jesus Christ. So here you see, I don't know if, I'm not sure which, which will, do you guys see this uh, um, slide uh, with no margins, right? Like, um, okay, I guess I can't really, you, I can't really explain. But here you see uh, President Donald Trump uh, being prayed over and there is a person called Paula White and she is also important in this history as she is uh, considered to be a personal personal past his uh, donald trump's personal pastor and uh, spiritual advisor so paula white uh, she prayed over them asking god to guide them in wisdom and protect them uh, in the days ahead uh, just days earlier white was traveling with trump on his plane when he brought up, brought up 
how Harry Truman surprised everyone by winning against Thomas Dewey in 1938. She says, I haven't personally seen this coming together, this coming together of the body of Christianity since 9-11, since which is um, very truly astonishing. So the reason, the reasoning of the other stream is always same throughout the history. So we want to, uh, out of this presentation, we want to take out that we want to remember that the civil war, in the civil war, the uh, the reasoning of the of the other side is that it is my religious freedom to keep slaves in the in the history of uh, um, of the 1950s, it's my religious freedom to allow African Americans not not to attend the same school. Um, in and the in the history of 9/11, it is Islamophobia, homophobia, and xenophobia. So it's it's my religious freedom not to have to t to bake a cake for a gay couple. And as you guys know that this issue is becoming a, um, is, is a, is a, um, is challenging for many people. So in each of these histories, uh, they are going, uh, they are, the Protestants are going against the constitution. And in, and in each of these histories, they are driven by the same ideology and their solution remains the same, which is to enforce morality. So I guess um, I guess this is all I have for you. If, if you have any more, if you have any questions, or if you want to go back and go over some of the slides, we can do that again. That was really good. Um, yeah, I, I think it's it was a little bit too short because I I don't know how it's just. I thought it would be, it would take forever, but. Um, I was watching, I think it was the PBS News Hour one, and I think they're trying to find constitutional support oh. for them not to, to be allowed to discriminate against gays because that's their right to do that. And yes, yes, you know, you know, this is very, this, this movement is truly, I, to me, I see that God is truly leading this movement, and the reason is because it makes sense. If you're thinking that the Sunday law is going to come as a Sabbath Sunday observance, and uh, it, wouldn't it be so obvious and so easy to distinguish it, to, to easy to recognize for the Seventh day Adventists? It's just, it was, it's very hard to understand how would it, how would we, you know, even even if you take that 50% of the Adventists will, will start keeping, keeping Sunday, it's just so hard to believe. But when you see in the history of World War II, and this is something that I wanted to actually also to present, but I think I, I do not want to do that now. In the history of World War II, it is astonishing that the people, Seventh-day Adventists, German Seventh-day Adventists, they did not see... To me, I think it was like a mini Sunday law. If we, if, if in this light that is coming now, that the Sunday law is truly, is not quite what we think it is. I mean, it's, it's in its very heart, Sunday law is this church and state, is the Ahaz and Jezebel. And as such, it's the church, is the religious views that is, it's religious views influencing the secular decisions in the government and uh, and in the history of world war ii in germany seventh day adventists they did not rec recognize their sunday law i mean i mean i mean no i may not be right but um it's it was exactly the, the government told them to uh um uh, obliged them uh, to mandated them to bear arms and uh, they had they were a small group of uh, I wouldn't say small but relatively you know they were not on the radar of, 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 of on Hitler's radar so it's not a big movement it's not like Catholics you know Seventh-day Adventists were quite small especially in Germany relatively 
and uh, but they made it a point to make sure um, that that the uh, that the people that the church members would actually be good patriot Germans and and pick up the arms. In uh, is, sorry, in Romania, when communism was there towards closer to the end or somewhere in the middle, I don't remember. They started to force all school children to go to school on the Sabbath. And the General Conference of the SDA Church in Romania told everyone to make their kids go to school on the Sabbath. So they had an actual, I mean, that's like a literal Sunday law right there, and they failed it. The whole General Conference failed it. And only the most, like, distraught people kept their kids home, even though it meant they weren't going to get an education and they didn't have they were very poor people, but they kept the Sabbath no matter what. So it was, is, uh, yeah. This is really astonishing. I mean, this, if you look also in the Soviet Union, what I'm trying to say is that if you look in the, in all these small little countries that we would think, we always look up to the United States and think that the Sunday law is always, you know, uh, originally starts in the United States. And yes, it does. But if you look in the little, in this little mini parable stories of our, um, of this smaller, you know, of the of the countries that are not United States, you know, the Sunday law is so is so it is so prominent. For example, the same happened in the Soviet Union when um, um, I think it was in World War One when the Seventh Day Adventists were or World War uh, post World War post World War Two. It was a there was a conflict. And the church, um, even so, it's not recognized and not uh, not respected by the government. The church still made a decision to follow the government and uh, and give up their uh, their people to the government. And uh, eventually, later on, uh, many years later, uh, the person that uh, was the uh, um, Head of the uh, head of that division uh, of that part of the um, seven, of that part of the Seventh Day Adventist, he he confessed and he apologized, and it's 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 interesting that it happens again and again on smaller scale, and it's the 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 church official church always submits itself to the government ruling, and not just submit itself. It, Adventist Church submit itself, but but in in the history of German uh, in the German history of World War II, it was the it was deeply religious uh, religiously driven government. Even so, we think of them as they were you know godless. In fact, they they had Hitler had a special special institute dedicated for the study of occult rituals and. Uh, uh, druids and um, you know ancient runes. It's called Ananerbe, and I don't know if you guys uh, heard about it, but it's uh, it's deeply, deeply occult. And uh, to imagine that the in this little mini histories we keep repeating it, the okay, the same history keeps repeating it over and over. Meaning that we can we can look at now and we can see that. If this is true, the Sunday law, the definition of this, but it's true that Ellen White herself, she gives the definition that Sunday law is the union of church and state, is the church riding the beast, church riding the religious views, riding uh, and dictating the government. And that uh, this happened already in many, in many, many cases, in many countries. But it's especially now, right now, it's becoming becoming a huge issue because like if i go to uh, my some of that friend of mine that i i don't know if not all of you have heard so i have a f um i still keep in touch with my church and uh, i used to go to church in siberia in tomsk and the uh, and and recently when i reconnected with him he was wearing a long long beard and I said, what's up with you? Like, why did you start, you know, uh, uh, grew yourself the longest beard? And he says, oh, against all these homosexuals that are, that are taking over Europe and, uh, and uh, you know, all this immorality. <laughs> and, and I thought to myself, he's speaking exactly the same language. And, and he's very, 
deeply godly person, you know, it's, it's unbelievable. So I, I guess I'm sorry, I, I took so much of the time just talking about. Um, no, it's all good. We're um, all in for a surprise, I think, continued surprises as to what our job function really is when it comes to racism, sexism, and discrimination and oppression and um, whether or not, I mean, a lot of the questions that come up are, are we supposed to advocate sin? And I yeah. said, no, we're not advocating sin. We're going to stand for the people's rights to make their own choice. And in doing so, some will be won over because the power of the Holy Spirit will be convicting their hearts and minds that what they are doing is sin because they're going to be loved by, by Jesus for, because they know not what they do. They're no longer yeah. being persecuted for their sin. They can now see it. Yeah. yeah. Um, I had a question in regards to couple questions in regards to the Sunday law. Um, how do we, how do we view now the parable of Ahab and Jezebel and Herod and Herodias in regards to this new life? Because before it was, Herod was the state, Her, Herod was the state, Herodias was the church, and then Salome was the false, was the apostate Protestants. And Likewise with Ahab and Jezebel and the false prophets. So how do we view those now without the papacy being a part of this circle? I thought that um, in something at Spalding and McGann, Sister White says that the Protestants do end up going back to the Catholic Church to their mother and asking her for advice on how to deal with us. Because the way that Parminder is talking about the papacy right now, he's saying, coming short of saying, and maybe I'm hearing him wrong, that they're actually good right now. He's saying okay, that see. because the, the, the relation, relationship that Francis right. had with Obama um, was good and what Pope, uh, what Pope Francis is doing with immigration and all these things, it's actually positive. So it really kind of drew the focus towards the apostate Protestant churches. But that can't be the case either if, if what you're saying is true. And Trump, is, Trump, he's pointing out that Trump and Francis are enemies. But he's also pointing out that Francis and Obama were, were friends and he's pointing out all the good things. He's, he's pointing out all the good things that Francis was doing in regards to immigration and in regards to racism and in regards to climate change and saying that he is not, you know, we're pretty much coming short of saying that he's not it's, it's not going to happen through the papacy. Yeah, yeah. I don't have an answer. I don't know if anybody else has the answer yet for, um, I haven't really looked at it enough to where you take those stories from, how you get the papacy out of there. Jo Jonathan, if I could, if I could, uh, uh speak. I, Lana, would you hold that thought? Um, can we bring in the Sabbath and then Lena will bring in her thought? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Oh dear Heavenly Father, we're so thankful to you that you have brought us all this way, that you have led us out of darkness into your marvelous light. Dear Father, please be with those who, can, who could not join us today, but we know that they are with us. Please, dear Father, keep them safe, keep Susan safe, and give her comfort. Oh dear Heavenly Father, please bless the Sabbath for all of us, that we may enjoy enjoy your presence and uh, especially give us eyes to see so that we might see and so that we might perceive and that we may understand. Give us reasoning, oh Father. Bless us today for this day. In Jesus' name we pray and we thank you and we love you. Amen. Amen. Wouldn't Jezebel then, I, I haven't thought it through, but wouldn't Jezebel then be the Protestants? Yeah, but then you have the false prophets who are there. Uh, right. Did, may I, so the, what I was trying to say is that I have heard, I, I think I have heard all, I listened to all of his presentations that, you know, in, in a, um, France. 
And from what I understood, I got, I know what you're saying. Uh, he, he sounded like he says that papacy are, but he, what he was actually, I think what he meant is that, not to say that what he meant, but in the context of what he was saying is that he was trying to show, like for example, are, um, are gays and uh, lesbians, are they going to be, are they, are we okay with, like, are we completely absorbing them now? No. So it's the same, so the same idea is that the Catholics, they are, right now, they are not the leading people in, in the, um, in this fight against the remnant. It's going to be, it's going to be the false prophet. It's going to be the, the daughters of, of Babylon. But right now, at this moment, as of now, papacy is not exhibiting those draconian um, qualities. But we, from the from what I understood, that the way he was leading, he was just showing to uh, help, helping us, leading us to see that that it was um, that the false prophet is the most dangerous at this moment. So it's not even so, even so this I this um, uh, the papacy, even so the false prophet is the one that's going to be the waging war against uh against the uh, remnant it is still by origin it's still catholic and it's still daughters of babylon even so the babylon is not doing it itself meaning that for example if you take in the um medieval times uh catholic church was not most mostly was not the one doing the executing the persecutions and tortures and uh, all these things but it would be delegating it to the uh to the gov to the governments its vassal of uh, vassals or um the governments that are you know under under the papacy so it's not so it's the same idea is that it doesn't mean that the papacy is like good now no it's not but it's with, with, with that being said, though, the, the points that he's making are right, because he's, he's saying that Pope Francis is, he's the first Jesuit pope, so, and, the, and the, Je the Jesuits are the liberal wing of the papacy. And so I guess the thing is, if the papacy does come back into the picture, going with that line of thinking, which I, which I can see is kind of correct, the Pope Francis would have to be ousted and they'd have to have a conservative Pope back in, in power because Pope Francis isn't going to align with Trump. And the, the same reason that, oh, I had it all figured out. Man. <laughs> uh, yeah, <laughs> when I try to talk, I can put it all together. Um, yeah, Pope Francis isn't going to align with Trump because they're, as far, they're polar opposites. So their line of thinking is different. So, and the Protestants as well. The Protestants are, even though they're not Protestant in every form, they're still not, I don't know that they're really aligned with the Pope because this Pope is a liberal Pope. And these Protestants that, that were, that are in charge of the state right now are conservative. So I don't see them finding a common ground on, on anything except for Sunday. I think it's interesting that when you had the Sunday Law in 1888, the Catholic Church was mad and ranted at the Protestants for their ridiculous ideas. They were kind of at odds then too. Yeah, you don't see the 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 alliance there, which I find is interesting because people who think that the papacy is going to be doing it all in the end, well, where was the papacy in 1888? They weren't even allowed in the Catholics weren't even allowed in the government back then. In the U.S. government, yeah. so they weren't even really a part of that Sunday law. Another thing that I had a question about, and these are just questions I have. I'm not doubting anything. I'm just there. It's just like loose ends. Um, Tess is saying when she's talking about the Sunday law that you know there's no way you're going to get a universal literal Sunday law today because places like Israel and Saudi Arabia or India they're not going to pass the Sunday law. And I'm thinking, okay, I can see that line. I can see the logic. 
but then if we go to 1888, are we, are we saying that those countries wouldn't have passed the Sunday law then if the Sunday law passed in America? Uh, is Israel, there is actually a proposal in Israel to have closing, closing or yeah, closing on Sundays. Um, not a law, but so because because they how does it work? It, anyway, it has been talked about in Israel about having a Sunday closing law. So there, the idea has been. But, but there could be a liberal wing there, or a wing there. that's different than the rest of the country. Like if it was passed, that would be one thing. But I can't imagine all of Israel accepting. Like they wouldn't accept it. And then go to Saudi well, Arabia. They're not going to. My mom and dad lived in Israel for eight months. They had the lights on in their apartment on the Sabbath, and everyone was about ready to stone them to death. Sorry, sorry. Mm -hmm. They're pretty in Israel. They still have the Jewish laws. So if someone has like a light on in their apartment on the Sabbath, they're they're going to be outside your door with cops and stones ready to kill you. Yeah. And how is Saudi Arabia going to accept a literal Sunday law? They're not. That's a Christian part of the Christian belief. Like it. I, I, you know, these are questions just to ask, like, how is, how is that? It's obviously not going to happen today because she, like, like she pointed out, if whatever, whatever the, the issue is going to be in our line, it, it had to have been seen by 1989, the time of the end. So you could see the literal Sunday law in the timeline of the Millerites and, and, and early Adventists. But you don't really, we didn't see, we don't see anything really, I mean, other than countries that are in Eastern Europe that are kind of passing these laws for Sunday, you don't really see it in the U.S. It's not being fought over, debated over, or anything. Can I put something out there? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, sorry. Well, I mean, because we know that the Sunday law isn't going to look like um, what we always thought. I don't know if we're going there, but... I just want to put that thought out there. But then also what I've been noticing is um, speaking of Israel and Jerusalem, the relationship that Trump is trying to get with them. I don't know. Like the coverage of him saying that, um, I think in the news, it was a tweet that went out that, um, what was it that he said? It's losing my mind. Um, he, I know he made the statement that he's the chosen one and that, um, what did he say about the Jews? Um, okay, sorry, I'm not going to say. I cannot remember. I don't know why, but I can't remember what. It was like um, this big thing. He said, uh, he said the Jews were disloyal because, because they weren't they're not going to back him up. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I know what you're saying, yeah. He was, he was saying that because, he, because he favors Israel, that they should fall in line. And, and back him up because he's back. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. He said any Democrat that votes any any Jewish Democrat that votes or any Jew that votes Democrat. Or whatever. So, he me, me. Yeah. So with those kind of tactics and the way Trump is, you know, that can probably have some influence over other countries. Um, you know, I just want to put that out there as a thought. You know, I don't know, but I'm just saying. Um, those are like possible things um, to consider when we're thinking about that. Like th these were statements of Tess's, not mine. So she's the one that said that you, there's no way you'll see a Sunday law in India, in Saudi Arabia, and Israel were the three examples that she used, not in our line. And I can see that logic. But yeah. the issue I have is those countries aren't really any different today than they were in 1888. Saudi Arabia was still a Muslim country. Israel was still Jewish and India was still Hindu. So that's the issue that I'm having is if we, we can, it, I can see us saying it today that they won't accept a Sunday law. But if we're saying that today, why would it be any different to say that in 1888 when the literal Sunday law was about to pass in the U.S. And we know that if it passed in the U.S., it would have gone international or whatever you call it. And those countries would have accepted it regardless of their faith and religion, which is the same as it is today. Mm. So I'm, I'm wondering if it has something to do because I don't maybe we didn't understand what this really meant then when it says that everyone's going to get the who gets the mark of the beast either in their hand or in their forehead I'm wondering if 
that combination might be some people might actually believe this spurious Sabbath, which is comes in whatever form it comes in, or some countries just follow in their hand or economically. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I think there's sometimes a couple different applications for things too, right? Like I think yeah. right on that, even though know, there are other applications. I, 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 I guess, I guess what I, what I think is the problem at this point, at this point, and I, not to say really a problem, but uh, something that we are facing is that if the Sunday law that we are, have been waiting for as a sub Sabbath Sunday observance, um, so, because we keep referring to the time when Ellen White talks about Sunday law, and and but there's two. There were two times, uh, two times when Jesus was going to come, and one of them, the first time he, there was no mention of, of Sunday law, but it was, but it was still, um, it was still, it was still. A, church and state related at least in the united states but i i don't know how it would happen in the in other countries and that is that is something that i i guess is a is very interesting to think about because actually if you go like in other countries if you are christian okay i'm not, not christian but specifically seventh day adventist like for example i when i was born in soviet union so in back home it's six days work days six working days so you have monday to saturday working and on sunday it's your day off meaning that whether you believe in god or not if you want to have a job you're going to have to find that kind of jobs that will that you will be able to keep sabbath and those kind of jobs are not the they are more like you know janitor or some some kind of uh, shift jobs that are more flexible so what i'm trying to say is that it's not so, so if if the united states is um christians in the united states have more freedom so for them sunday law is the is the is an issue that will decide their faith okay at least in that history in the world you are by default are doomed but if you want to be saved you're going to have to find ways to keep sabbath have ways to um, uh, find a job that would be that would make you able to keep sabbath so so by default you are made to um to keep sabbath uh, to keep a sun to have sunday law whether you define it as sunday law as being a Sabbath Sunday observance or or anything else that is pushed on you and goes against God's principles like for example if you if you're working in like a teacher of uh, like my grandmother she was teaching a um, teacher of uh, dialectic materialism so basically atheism and Darwinism in, uh, in the college and and uh, at some point she stopped believing in it but she still taught it so for me that was her sound sunday law because you you know it's wrong you don't believe in it but yet you go to work and you do you know you get your reward yeah like um and i'm not trying to i guess i don't know all the answers but this is just one of the avenues that i think we can think think in that uh in many of those countries that are that do not have five working days most of many countries have six working days and they are all there it's it's very it's very hard to find five five working days it's and it's if that is if that is the issue it's solved by it's like by default you're doing it you're obliged by default so you're going to have to find ways to not uh to not break sabbath for example or to not uh, do not break, go against the principles like teaching Darwinism while you know it's wrong. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, but I'm not, I'm so not sure. I mean, countries, they have already Sunday law by default. 
Yes. And so what you're doing is you're you're coming out of the Sandeva mindset because they're already in that mindset. Yes, they're in there by default. It's not like Christians that have lived without Sandeva and then the Sandeva was imposed on them. Yeah. So you're automatically you're living in that environment and to be saved, you're going to have to come out of it. Yeah. Wow. Coming out of that one. You're not guilty of a sin until you're aware of it. Yeah. You know, if they've been living in that framework for all that time, when they become convicted of some of, of it, then that's when they have to come out, but they're not guilty of it while they're in there. Yeah. This is where it's going to come down to as well. Um, I'm kind of working on stuff for tomorrow. Sorry. Um, but where it's going to come down to why they need to be outside the city. Because it's not going to be a Sunday law like we think. It's going to be oppression and coming under um i'm going to talk about it more tomorrow so i don't i'm trying to work on that tonight but um there, it's going to be under oppression the more that we can get our lives in alignment now with living according i, I don't know if this is right but according to what is coming the easier it's actually going to be for us um when it comes to being I'm trying, I don't have the quotes in front of me right now when she talks about how to be on the Sabbath, not to, not to, um, maybe somebody remembers what knows what I'm talking about when it comes to not working on Sunday and following their laws on Sunday and, and that type thing. Um, but the more we get ourselves in alignment with our, our lives being like living outside the city, being able to grow our own food, um, being able to not be under the um, thumb of government as much, you know, outside the city as you would be inside the city. So it's going to make it easier for us to, to do so. I can see that more and more as we're looking at this poverty and um, slavery issue. And and uh, hopefully we'll talk more about it tomorrow. Maybe if, if hopefully we have time in between because uh, one of the classes is only an hour long. So I kind of put together some other stuff just in case we have time for it. But everything is turning upside down. It's not going to look like we think. Yeah, that that I I that uh, with this movement, everything right right now to me right, becomes really clear. It hasn't. It was it was very hard to for me to accept how would how and how would people who know that the you know the Seventh Day Adventists there is like ten million Seventh Day Adventists and how is it that they will be deceived into keeping Sunday it's it's very hard to imagine unless you unless you introduce actually an Elaine that you posted once you you showed the quote where Ellen White says that the the spurious Sabbath is the it's not just an observance of the the union of church and state is the yes. spurious Sabbath Yes, and that very definition of church and state is this uh, Sunday law uh, makes everything clear that whether there is going to be an actual Sunday law or not, we know that the definition, the true definition, the one that really uh, uh, responds to this definition is actually is already here and we're in it. And many of us, well, I wouldn't say of us, but many in the Adventist church have accepted this ideology. We have been, you know, been thinking bad about, you know, homosexuals and uh, this and that kind of group of pe groups of people. You know, and if we only understood that this message, if you look actually in the writings of, of H. Jones, if, I, I encourage you to read the, the American Sentinel, all, all of its issues, all, all the issues. They are so powerful. They really, as if they were cut out for us. And to, uh, to imagine that, I guess, midnight crime message never changes, which is really, to me, I think is kind of amazing because it's the same message that the, the roots, the very concepts that is on the foundation is the same. Mm -hmm. And the, the, it, it's the same also the message on the false, on the, on the, on the um, Protestant evangelicals side. 
they have the same ideology all the way from the beginning and and we too which is which really shows that now we are becoming uh two separate groups of uh two separate groups of of people yeah it's interesting because god had god had leveled the playing field with this with this message with this turnaround with it not being about the sabbath because it doesn't seem fair and it doesn't seem consistent with what god has always done that he was going to give some sort of special um so that salvation was only for Adventism. And that's what we kind of believed. As long as we kept the Sabbath, that we have our salvation. As long as we st stand strong and stand firm for our faith and religion. But when Jesus came, he didn't come. He, he wasn't looking for those that were aligning themselves with the civil government. He wasn't looking for those that were aligning themselves with other religious um, like-minded people or anything like that. He came straight to the sinner. And we... You know, the way that this turned around, it just made me realize that, you know, we're the 144,000 are going to reflect the image of God. They're going to be Christ on earth as a collective. Amen. And they're going to be going to, they're going to be reaching out to these hearts of people who are, who we've always deemed lost if they didn't come into our fold. And we were the ones that had the wrong mentality the whole time. So, the fact that it's turning around, it, I mean, it makes so much sense that why can so many, there's 20 million Adventists in the world, over 20 million now. And, you know, how is it that they could all fall for the Sunday law? Well, the thing is, it's because they don't, they don't go, they're only really worried about their own salvation. And that was the issue with the Jews. And when Christ came, he came to, sh he came to show the teachers, the religious teachers, that they should have been paying attention to the sinners and in, in a way to bring them salvation. And they weren't doing that, so he went directly to them himself. And that's what he's going to get us to do. But we had to change first, like the disciples. And I just think that the whole turnaround, it makes so much more sense than everything I believed about, about the Sunday law before. I've got no issue with it at all. I just have loose ends and questions that I don't fully understand. And I'm just, you know, the more I watch, the more it makes sense. And I still always have that little bit of fear you know, when I'm hearing, it's like, because it's so contradictory to what we had always thought. I was yeah. a liberal, a liberal minded person growing up in the world. And like I said, the other day, I, I, I still can't understand why God turned me around. I'm not blaming him. I shouldn't say why God did, but I, I became a Christian and became conservative just to turn around again, to have that liberal mindset, the true liberal mindset of liberty. Mm -hmm. And it's like, well, wasn't I there? Yeah, <laughs> it's just it's really but it's flopped me up on my head because I don't think that I would have been completely conscious of it before and I think I always even as a non-Christian non-believer I always in my mind believed that you know things like homosexuality and abortion were wrong which I which I still do mm -hmm. but it might have caused me to have the wrong perspective about the people that were participating in those sins rather than looking at the sin itself and, and condemning the sin yeah. but for whatever reason God and I'm sure everyone's got their own story God took us on a really long trip because it's the only way he could show us yeah <laughs> and, it, and it comes it's going to come back continuously to our own hearts that we would be able to uh not be able to but surrender to him and be used by him that that we could um be that example of liberty and the right to choose and and uh and that that alone that not that alone but i mean that will play a role because who said it earlier commented on something i was saying that they're no longer going to be persecuted they're going to you know and there's going to be the power of the conviction of sin upon them mm -hmm. while there be while there is somebody standing up for their equality because they'll be beholding Christ on earth. Yeah. And, 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 and we're going to be it, it lumped into that group of um, being mistreated. I think that's something to think about and be prepared for. We're going to be um, lumped into that group. And that's, that's what caused sinners to turn to Christ because Christ, he came to the, he came to the sinners and he was perfect and righteous and they were con convicted and converted because he, he, he pointed out what their sin was, but he 
he didn't separate himself from them, you know, and that's, I don't know, I'm just, the whole thing is just the more I think about it. And, the, you know, when the Israel was going through the wilderness, it's because they still had a lot of learning to do. And that's what God ha had to do with us. Yes. He had to bring, bring us through the wilderness because we weren't ready to enter into Canaan. You, can't en we, you couldn't enter into Canaan in the condition that Adventism was in. 1888, they went into the wilderness. And here we are about to enter into Canaan. But he's, and, you know, Israel had to stop whenever God said stop. And as soon as they got stopped and they set up camp and it wasn't when God didn't give them a countdown, six more days until we move, five more days till we move. It's when that light left the, left the temple, when he left the temple, that was their sign to move. So they were always, as soon as they got comfortable, God said, we're moving again. And that's what he's doing with us right now is because we think that we're, <laughs> we've got something down pat and then he, the light picks up and moves forward and we have to move with it yeah <laughs> no comfort <laughs> just, i don't know i think i think the moment that we feel comfortable is is the moment we're kind of in a danger zone um exactly. from what i'm hearing and learning that uh, we're not to be in a place of complacency you know we're to be in a place of constantly growing not being not settling with just um how can i say it um with past, okay, put it this way. We're not, not just to be um, content with past victories, but we're to seek to, you know, grow from that, ever learn and, and become higher and higher and better and better, you know, until we reach um, full, total perfection, which is complete um, um, humanity um, and divinity together. Um, when we have that complete oneness with God, and um, I think even after, you know, uh, those who are faithful and make it um, will still be learning, um, like, different lessons, you know, on different things. But um, so there's ever that move, that, that place of not just being stagnant, you know, or um, um, you're always growing. I will just put it like that. You know, we're always growing into, it's very dangerous to think we've arrived or we've, um, we're there, you know, when, when, um, there's always that, um, that, um, that space or what do I want to say? Uh, that place for improvement, that place for growth, I guess. Well, like, like God's showing us right now, we, we all have prejudice underneath our surface and we've had we had piety that was blinding us for so long. And now, right in the right time, right before we're about to cross over that, that line, he's saying, you guys have to look at yourself right now. Because if you're going to cross that line and be my people, you have to recognize that what's, in, what's inside of you and the prejudice. You guys have no problem seeing the problems with the world and the problems with Adventists and the problems with liberals or whatever. But you need to look at yourself because you're going to be the ensign. I just think it's great. And I just, I, you know, it's such a short amount of time. And I'm not even, not that I'm not concerned about it, but I know that if God is bringing this out now, then he, that means that there's time. You know, it, it's not that we're too late. It's all in God's time and it's the exact time for it. Amen. Yeah, I, that's why I, I you know, many things brought me to that study the other night, and uh, it just kind of worked out that Sister Lana wasn't able to be there, and uh, mm -hmm. because I just see that that's what, you know, as I'm going through Deuteronomy, came out of Numbers and going in through Deuteronomy, it's like you can just see over and over and over again getting his people ready, but all of the children of, the, all the children in the wilderness that were the older generation Anybody that had that wilderness thinking that did not shake off that wilderness wilderness thinking, they had to die off before they went into the promised land. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that's what we're seeing, a spiritual death happening within the movement. And mm -hmm. that's a scary thing. Yeah. yeah. You know, some people are wanting the comfort of, their, and they're trying to reach out to Elder Jeff because they want to be assured that this message is true but if elder jeff passed the mantle 
if it was John to Jesus, Elijah to Elisha, if the disciples of Jesus or if the disciples of John kept looking back to John to see if Jesus was true or right, and and they clung to, to John the Baptist, they weren't going to progress with the message. And that's what happened. You can read it in Desire Ages chapter chapter 18. Yeah. That it talks about that, that the disciples were jealous, that the disciples of John were jealous. And yeah. they were unsure. And it's a dangerous thing to say that you need to have the assurance of John the Baptist to know whether or not you can trust Jesus. Amen. That's true. You know, so it's, it's um, and John the Baptist had faults. And Elder Jeff had faults. And it's nothing to say against him. I don't, I don't, I don't know him. He's blessed every single one of us. He's done more work than, you know, I know we're all grateful for it, but he passed the mantle. So it wasn't some, someone didn't come and take it from him. He gave it and he was instructed, I'm sure to do that. So it's a dangerous thing to, to look back and just, and to hold back. I know it's a fearful thing right now. I mean, to, to, see this message which seems to be something that's completely different than what everyone knew a year ago you know but it's that's yeah. the faith that god wants he's picking us up and he's moving us it's it's proving who really loves him because who really loves them is doing what they need to do he's working with them they're moving forward he and and it's it's just testing do we really love him and and so as we come through these changes um, our love is being shown on how we adapt to these changes um in our and we need wisdom we need discernment every single day we need to be asking for that as we go forward because he's 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 bringing us to where we 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 will have to know like abraham we will have to know his voice amen we're looking at that now i mean as we're going through the several issues that have come out we need to know his voice because he's calling us to do things that um that are different than what we've always known he's teaching us that things are going to be this instead of all we've always known it to be that and and if we don't know his voice and if we don't truly love him our actions show in how we work with one another how we treat one another um in so many ways our actions show more than our words so we can talk the talk and we can say the words that that we love him and we obey him and we this we that but if our actions don't support it we don't really love him mm -hmm. yes amen can we, i go ahead yeah um i just want to ask a <clears throat> quick question not to change the subject but just concerning um tyler's recent presentation um I just had a question about that because he says that he, um, this is the exact quote of what he said. Um, he says that he doesn't agree that after sin entered the, the earth, Adam's and Eve's relationship did not change. Um, or Adam and Eve's relationship, yeah, did not change with Adam now being the head of the household. So my question is, when did it change? Like, when did men because he, he in his um sermon or presentation he's basically stating that um that adam and eve they were still keeping the same relationship that they had before sin entered and that that prop that um that prophecy or that um how can i say it's not that it was a prophecy but it's also kind of like the punishment that god gave them or um yeah, I think I'm saying it right, was for future generations that, um, yeah, that, because we know that prophet speaks more for, um, less for their time and more for the time of another generation or he, generation. He wasn't placing it on the line strictly. He was just saying that him personally, he doesn't see how that would have happened, but I don't think he thought it out to the point where he knew where it did start to happen. I, th I think that what he meant, though, too, is because I watched it and he said, um, I think what he meant was that God, when you in Patriarchs and Prophets, I can't remember, it's one of the first few chapters where he talks about it, where Ellen White talks about it, that the, the, the woman was going to be put below the man. Yeah. Change their way. 
he was still over her. Like he was still, the responsibilities were there for a man and a woman, but because yeah. they, they were the first ones out of sin. So that, so what happened was that was a gradual thing that happened over time where the man started to oppress the woman, the woman. Yeah. Because they just didn't know how to, the further we, we came away from the garden, the more, I always have a lack of finding the right word. I always say decrepit, <laughs> we became. But yeah, it was a progressive um, fall. Continued per- worse. We've gotten worse and worse. So our judgment and everything has become more and more terrible. So I think that Adam and Eve, I think that Tyler's probably right. I because think- Yeah, me too. I agree. I agree with Brother Tyler. I'm just asking, like, I agree with him. Um, totally. I'm just asking, when did that change? Like, when it did... It was over time. It was gradual. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think what you're... When do you have... Um, like, first... Off the top of my head, I can't remember, but when you have the first big... Polygamy. Yes. The yeah. first polygamy in Genesis. Thank you. Polygamous. Uh, I can't remember who did... Lana, did Sister Lana... Cain. I think it's Cain... Um, no, it it was uh, it wasn't Cain. It was um, it was what's his name? Yeah, it was. I think his his name was no, it wasn't Lamech. It it was um, was it? Hold on. Yeah, Lamech took himself two wives. His father. Yeah, I think it was Lamech. Yeah, his lineage. Two wives, right? Yeah. Holiba, was it a Holiba? Or do I have that no, no, it wasn't all of it. It was a. Uh, that's close to her name, but that, yeah. yeah I can't um, um, but yeah, they. Uh, Ada, I think, is one of them. Ada. Yeah. So maybe now, you know, because you had Cain come along, and we know his condition, and then it just continued to deteriorate. But then he was. Well, then your voice is really low. I can hardly hear you. What's that? Your voice is really low. It wasn't really what long? I can't hear you. I can't. You're yeah. really sound far away. Oh, everybody else can hear me? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Your, your mic seems to fade in and out. Uh, okay. Sorry. I don't know. Um, and I know that because uh, I was having the same problem with, with Adriana as well. I don't know why it does that. Yeah, it was. Yeah, it's it was Lamech. So wow, thank God for thank you, Lord, for that memory. Yeah, it it was Lamech and his two wives. It um were Ada and Zilla. So uh, or Z- or Zila, Ada and Zila or Zilla. Okay. Well, I'm trying to turn up the mic a little bit. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. I don't know why it does that. But yeah, so, so you know, I know it started with Cain, but then you go, and I think the one you, Lamech, I think he was um, four generations down, which would actually kind of make sense. Um, I think I'm pretty sure he's fourth generation. In the genealogy, anyway. Anybody else have anything they want to? Um, then if we're finished we can close in prayer and then I can work on getting the audio set up and out and get ready for tomorrow somebody want to close in prayer thank you sister Lana for tonight oh, no problem thank you putting up with me I have made so many mistakes <laughs> <laughs> No way, that was a really good. I got the long list of them <laughs> for myself. Um, Brother John, do you want to pray? Sure. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we just want to give you thanks for the blessing of yet another Sabbath day, Lord. Um, the end of another week that we've been blessed to have, Lord. And Lord, I pray that this, this Sabbath will be a blessing to all those who, who worship on this day, Lord. I pray for all those uh, who call themselves the people of God, including ourselves here, Lord, that we would hearken unto your voice and that we would hear, Lord, and understand and recognize your voice always. And I pray that we would not let our own personal pride and our own personal prejudices, Lord, keep us from 
understanding and knowing the message that you have for us here in this time, Lord, that speaks of highly of righteousness and godliness and and all the things that we should understand as people who declare your name. Father, I pray that you will continue to lead us and, and be patient with us, Lord. And I pray for the hearts of those that may be having doubt. I'm sure there's a little bit of doubt in everyone's heart, Lord, um, that needs to be weaned out, Lord. And I just pray that you will reassure us and that we will walk ahead in faith, Lord, and trust um, that we do know your voice as we've seen how you dealt with us in the past. And Lord, that this message is, is combined. We can follow it in our line all the way back to 1989. So Lord, if things seem odd to people now, all we have to do is look back and recognize that it was a, a clear straight path that led us all the way here. And so I pray Lord that, um, You'll help us, every each and every one of us, to see that. That uh, you'll help us to come together in unity and not to hide ourselves because we are starting to have doubt, or because, um, or, or to hide ourselves um, from each other, Lord. I pray that none of us would uh, murmur against the message, but that we would open these um, these questions up with each other. And I pray that each person would be patient with their brothers and sisters who may be treading a little bit slower than than the others and i know that we all fall behind lord and it's a group effort so father i just pray that, that um i pray that those who are having doubts that they would not allow it to drag them back lord and i pray that um we don't want to see anyone fall away lord and we know that people fall off all along the way but it's a choice and i know that each person here has a choice lord and you've blessed us with that. So I, I, just, I just pray, Lord, that we, we listen and we, and we pray and we study and, and we watch, Lord, and, and that we trust you all the way through. Mm -hmm. I pray, Lord, that the Sabbath will be a blessing for each one here. I pray for the services, the online service tomorrow with the Sacramento Fellowship, Lord, for those who are participating. I pray that uh, everything will go well and um, that the studies will be a blessing and that uh, there'll be no issues with the with the setup Lord online we thank you so far for having blessed us with, blessed us with things like zoom and whatsapp and Facebook uh, when they're used properly Lord they've they can be quite a blessing to bring us all together although we're also spread so far apart so I pray for each person here I pray especially for the ones that couldn't make it Lord for whatever reason they're not here and I pray for all the families of um, your precious followers Lord they are our greatest burden. Lord, we, we love you and we thank you and pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Can I add to that real quick? Certainly. Everybody mind? Heavenly Father, we just want to lift up the international camp meeting that is getting ready to begin. That everyone has arrived safely and all the all those that are involved in the setup and preparing, that you would bless all their hands. I pray for the speakers. And the leaders, Father, that will all be present, that you would give them a greater portion of your Holy Spirit, that they would be bold and courageous in all that you give them to say. And I pray for all of us, Father, to be um, prepared for whatever it is you're going to you're going to bring out during this camp meeting, and that all of us, Father, would be quick drinking our water as those in Gideon's army knowing the urgency of the times that we're living in and pleading on our knees each and every day to have you search our hearts if there is any hidden defilement in us, Lord, that we would not do anything to hinder our ability to hear your voice and to walk in all your ways. So bless the meetings, Lord. I pray for a blessing upon those that are doing the recording that that perhaps there's a ability to get them uploaded quickly, Father, and that we might all be um, partakers of the rain that you're going to pour out, Lord. Give us the wisdom we need. Give us the discernment we need, Father, and help us to love one another and to encourage one another and to pray for one another. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Yeah. Very significant camp meeting going on. Yeah. So 